Lord began to speak to me about his people. And what he began to tell me is that my people are comfortable. They're comfortable. They're comfortable. And because they're comfortable, they're not releasing the sacrifice that I'm asking them for because they are believing that this state of comfort is me. And the Lord wants you to know today that yes, we will live in his blessings and yes, he will bring comfort and peace and joy. He will do that, okay? But when he asks us to do something, it is not for us to determine whether we want to do it, but rather it is for us to obey. And so what's happening is that we have gotten to a place of comfort where we think we can tell God yes when we want to tell God yes, and we can tell God no when we want to tell God no. And how many of you know you're not supposed to say no to the king? How many of you know when the king speaks, you respond with a yes? When the king says jump, you don't say let me see, you say how high. You know what I'm saying? Amen? You, you know, um, Luke, that's what's going to happen in your life. Come over here, Luke. I want you to understand something, okay? The Lord brought you here so that he can transform you. The Lord brought you here so that you can go back and release your testimony to your family and so that they can come out of where they're at right now because they're in a, in a horrible place right now. But the Lord wants to use you. You, you have to understand that the Lord wants to use you, not anybody else, because they won't believe anybody else's testimony because they know you, they'll believe yours. So the Lord doesn't just want to transform you in your heart. He wants to cause his blessings to overflow in your heart and in your life. You, you've got to understand that he will use you like a prodigal because while they think you left because you're crazy, you are actually following the spirit of the Lord. And as a prodigal, you will go back. And, is, and, and you know, in the Bible, it says the prodigal was given the coat, the ring, and the shoes. But you're going to take the coat, the ring, and the shoes to your family because he's going to dress you and he's going to adorn you. All you've got to do is obey. Are you hearing me? He will do it for you. Don't worry about what people think about you. Don't worry about the situation you're in right now. You focus on God. And not only is he going to bring you out of that situation, not only are you going to see that none of that matters anymore, but you're going to begin to walk out the call that was in your dreams many, 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 many years ago. Because you used to have dreams. But then all this frustration and all this chaos, they've kind of blocked your ability to dream. And God says, son, I'm going to open you back up to the dreams. I'm going to cause you to dream again. I'm going to cause you to have hope again. I'm going to cause you to see what you couldn't see. And as God begins to unveil this to you, the secret is going to be that you remain in his heart, that you remain seeking his heart. Stay humble and yet be bold. Stay humble and yet be confident. Stay humble and know that he is God. Because the prosperity he wants to bring to you is going to be the prosperity that you will also release on your family. That's how much prosperity he will bring upon you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, I'm going to lay hands on you because I'm going to release grace for that all to come to pass. You got to let go of the past if you want it to come to pass. You got to let go of the past if you want it to come to pass. Don't worry about what they're doing right now. Don't worry about what they're going through right now. You worry about your relationship with God because God's going to take care of that when it's time. Amen? Does that make sense to you? 100%? Praise God. Lift your hands. Father, right now, I release your grace upon them, Lord. 
I release your deliverance, your mercy upon your son now. I declare that his heart is healed and that his spirit will come alive and that everything that you have for this young man will come to pass. And Father, those that have walked away from him, those that have called him a disgrace, those that don't understand him, they will see and know that you are God. I declare it over his life. I declare your power and your authority upon him. Let it be that as he walks, signs, miracles, and wonders will follow him. Father, I release your love. <laughs> Saturate him with your love that he would know without a doubt that he is your son. Now, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Matthew 7, 24 to 27, praise God, says, So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man who built his house on the rock. Anybody here building their house on the rock? Verse 25 says, And the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. We've been talking about the kingdom. We've been talking about the foundation, what we are building on. And we need to make sure that we are building upon his word. We need to make sure that we are, we are building upon Jesus Christ. Jesus was the word, is the word that became flesh. And we need to understand that everything we do, everything we're going to do, everything we build, everything we're going to build, everything we want to add to our lives must be in accordance, must be aligned with the word of God. Because if we build any other way, then when the rain comes and the flood comes, what's the rain in the floods and the torrents. It's the circumstances in life. It's everything that's going on in your life. It's the chaos that tries to bring you out of the peace and the joy that God has for you. And this is why in verse 26 it says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. So the key is, are you doing the word or not? He's not telling you you can't build. He's not telling you you can't be successful. He's not telling you to do something that you don't want to do. What he's telling you is to build according to his word. And when you build, you're acting on the word. In other words, if you have a revelation, you've got to walk it out. You cannot have a revelation from God and not apply it to your life. You've got to apply it to your life. And when you apply it, what you're doing is you're setting a foundation that you can then build upon that will not be destroyed, no matter what comes. Amen? And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish, stupid man who built his house on the sand. Now, the sand represents the things of this world. If you are still doing things according to the things of this world, if your foundation is according to this world, then circumstances are going to come and you're going to get knocked over. You're going to get knocked down. Whatever you're building is going to... You, you ever heard the term that when they pull the rug from under your feet? That's what's going to happen if you build on the sand. A lot of times what happens is you, you begin to see... You begin to see something being produced by your hands and so you immediately say, this is God, it's a blessing. But just because a principle is working in your life doesn't mean it's a blessing of God. And so if you do not discern and you begin to build on that thing, it, it's the sand, it's the worldly aspect of it, then what you build can be pulled right from under your feet because it's the, the, the rug represents the foundation. I don't know about you, but I don't want the rug pulled from under my feet. You know what I'm saying? Okay, and then 27, or actually that's it. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great and complete was its fall. So when we talk about building a house, what are we talking about? We're talking about building our lives. We're talking about building our family's lives. We're talking about building in the ministry that God has called us to. And we're talking about building for the community that we live in, the culture that we live in. So when God refers to house here, I need you to understand that it is four-dimensional. It's not just about you. Amen? It's not just about an individual. 
This is, I'm talking 4D here, not 3D, 4D. Okay, because it's about you, it's about the ministry he puts you in, it's about your family, and it's about the community we live in. So that's why he has called redemption to this region. He has called redemption to this region because he believes and knows that if we will obey as individuals, our house will be built on the foundation and we will not fall. He knows that if as individuals we're building, then our families can be built on that foundation. And he knows that a family that has the foundation of the rock, Jesus Christ, the word, then that family cannot be destroyed. He knows that if that foundation is what the church is, so, so how does the church get put on that foundation? Because all of us make the foundation of the church. So we need individuals with families that are building on the rock so that we can go ahead and be the church, the ministry that is being built on a rock so that as, as that foundation grows, we can impact the region because one of us alone cannot impact what all of us together can impact in this region. Amen? Amen. So I just want you to understand, when it says house there, we're talking four-dimensional. Amen? All right. Then Matthew 6, 9 through 10 says, Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Does anybody need heaven on earth? So you got to build with the right foundation in order to pull down heaven on earth. What are you pulling from heaven when we talk that, when we say this? What are we doing? We're, we're calling down God's original intent for our lives. We're calling down what is needed, what, what he wants to provide for us so that our lives can be distinguished from the lives of the wicked. We're calling down whatever it is that we need that's in alignment with his will, his purpose for our life. Because how many of you know in heaven, there is a book about you that has your original intent. And if, there's a, and if he wrote it, if he wrote your original intent in that book, he wants you to pull the words of that book on heaven so you can live it out. And then the words of your book can become flesh on this earth. I know that's a very different way to look at it, but I'm here to tell you God wrote about you in heaven. He thought about you in his heart. And there are things in heaven that you're not living out yet. And if you'll align yourself with his kingdom, with your king, then those things that have been written about you will begin to get released from heaven. And everything that you need will be provided for you as you get closer and closer to him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And then, and then let's go to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. So if you want to pull down what's in heaven for your life, you better get ready because what you're doing is you're causing God's word about you to become living and active and full of power. Now, that might be hard for you to believe, but it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth according to the word of God. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. So what's going to happen? That word is going to, you, you got to understand this. There is a kingdom that doesn't want to let you go. There is a kingdom that you belong to before you ever belong to that kingdom that don't want to let you go. So there is a fight for you not to live according to what God thought of you in his heart, according to what God wrote of you in heaven. There's a fight for you not to get there. And God wants what he wrote about you, what he thought about you to become living, to become active and full of power. That's why we are being perfected into the image of Christ because everything was made in him, through him, and for him. So if everything was made in him, through him, and for him, what, what do you think that means when, when God thought of you before the foundations of the earth? You were made in him, through him, and for him, because he is the word that became flesh. You're being perfected in his image. So now God is trying to get you back to your original intent. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's not too uh, convoluted or scientific for you, but it's the truth. Amen. 
How many of you want to walk with power? So, so let's, let's look at it backwards. How many, how many of you know that the Israelites read, read the opposite way than we read? So if you want power, you got to let the word become active as you live it out. If you want power, you got to make active that living word of God. That's why it's so important that we read the Bible. That's why it's so important that we don't just read it and walk away, but we read it to do it. Amen? Because in it is the power to produce your original intent. Amen? Praise God. And so why don't we do that? Why is it difficult for us? Let's go to Romans 12.1. I'm going to be reading out of the Good News Bible from uh, the United Kingdom on a lot of the scriptures. Uh, but, but Romans 12.1 says this, So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. So when the Lord says, I want you to live your life as a worship unto me, what he's telling you is to be a living sacrifice. What he's telling you is, read my word, spend time with me so I can speak to you and you can receive my word so to the point where you begin to do my word. So you can look at it like this. How many of you know that a man, when, when a man and a woman sleep together, there's a seed that's released that, that's, that is then incubated and cultivated within the belly so that then it can come forth as fruit. We call it a baby, but it's a fruit, right? So when you spend time with God and he releases a word, it's a seed that's brought into your heart. And if you'll incubate it and if you'll cultivate it, that word will become a part of your life and you will see it's fruit. Amen? So how, how, how can that happen? You've got to be a living sacrifice. You've got to be willing to sacrifice. Well, what, I don't understand what a sacrifice is. Well, I'll tell you what a sacrifice is. You read the word, and it says, um, thou shalt not lie. Anybody ever read that? <laughs> if you didn't read it, you surely saw it in the Ten Commandments with Moses, right? Praise God. And so it says, thou shalt not lie. And then something happens and somebody asks you a question and you want to lie. So how do you become a living sacrifice? You don't lie. I mean, it's really that. I know we make it really, really hard, but it's that simple. The problem is we fear the person who's asking us the question more than we fear God. And because we fear the person asking the question more than we fear God, God, we lie. Because we rather please the person than please God. Amen? Boy, it sure got quiet in this Pentecostal church. Woo! That was an easy one. Uh-oh, we in trouble now. Houston, put on your seatbelts now. And so the Lord began to speak to me about this whole living sacrifice thing. You know, he took me to the scriptures and different things. Um, and, and the first scripture he talked to me uh, through was Galatians 5, 22 to 23, okay? And, and, and number one today, never set the law above his love. Never set the law above his love. Let's read the scripture so you can understand what I'm talking about. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says, But the fruit produced by his presence, Holy Spirit within and through you, is divine love. I, I know we talk about the fruits of the spirits, but I want you to understand today the fruit of the spirit is love. And its expression are the rest of the fruit that we're going to talk about here. So it says, but the fruit produced by his presence. Has anybody been in his presence today? Oh, come on. If you're in the room, you, you, you were in his presence. 
right? So, so that means the Holy Spirit is here. That means that love is being produced right now. See, but in order for that love to flow through you, you you're going to have to maybe not do some of the things that you might want to do. You're, you're, in order for you to express that love, you're going to have to act in ways that maybe you're not used to. So what we do is we cancel love, the fruit of the Spirit, because we don't want to express that love according to the Word. And so what we're doing is we're actually denying becoming a living sacrifice in that moment. Because, you, you know, I know the Bible talks about laws, and I don't want to get into teaching all of that right now, uh, but you have laws. See, most of the laws that Jesus came to cancel were the traditions and laws of man, not of his father. See, he didn't cancel the law of the blood that cleanses. All he did was bring it to higher truth. So, so when Jesus died on the cross, his blood superseded the blood of an animal to the point where it cleansed both the earth and the heavens. So, so the law of the blood cleansing and washing you of your sin was not canceled, but rather it was brought to a higher revelation. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, because I, I, I know how Christians live. We don't live by the law. That's why a lot of people don't tithe, because we don't live by the law. But they knuckleheads, because tithing came before the law was ever written. But because we don't understand the law, we speak out of turn, which goes right back to our level of comfort. We don't understand the law, so we speak out of turn because we want to remain comfortable. Anybody ever wanted to remain comfortable? Anybody ever sitting on the couch and you get thirsty and one of your children are walking by and you want to stay in the comfortableness of your couch? So you say, hey, get me some water. <laughs> okay, let's finish reading this scripture. But the fruit produced by his presence, Holy Spirit within and through you is divine love and all its varied expressions. So what are the expressions of this love? So you got to understand the scripture because you, you can't look for joy if you have not love because joy is an expression of his love. So, so if, if you're unwilling to have joy that overflows, you're canceling his love. <laughs> Inner peace that subdues. What, what does it subdue? Chaos. Patience that endures. You know what that means? How we act while we wait in. How do you act while you waiting? Man, how did you act while you were waiting for your wife this morning? <laughs> it never fails. Somebody always responds. <laughs> <laughs> Kindness in action. Well, I'm not going to be nice to them because, you know, they don't deserve it. Or you just cancel love. You just canceled yourself from being a living sacrifice, which is the worship that God is looking for from you. Let's see, let's see. A life full of virtue. Uh oh. We won't even go there right now because I could go on and on. Faith that prevails. You know, it's impossible to please God without faith. But you can't have faith unless you have love. Gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. And then it says, never set the law. Now, this is in the New Testament. The New Testament that most Christians read and say, well, there is no law. Because we live by grace. Do you know that grace is to help you live above the law? See, we've taken grace so that we can sin. And we've said grace is to release mercy upon us because we're going to keep sinning. That's not what grace is. Grace is the empowerment to live above the law. Uh-oh. I got some of y'all looking at me now like, what you talking about there? 
Grace gives you the ability to do what you can't do. It doesn't mean that the law is completely written away. Now, do we stop killing chickens and goats and, <laughs> and cows and bulls? And Yeah, because it specifically says that Jesus came to replace that. And he also came to replace the traditions of men and the laws of men. So unless you know which ones God wrote, I think he wrote the ones on the mountain. I think we call it Mount Sinai. I, I don't know. I think those are the ones that God wrote with his finger. Huh. You know, those cover everything. They cover everything. Because you won't rob your neighbor if you love your neighbor. <laughs> you won't lie to your neighbor because God said don't lie to them. Right? You won't covet what your neighbor has because you know God has what you need. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Okay, so number one today, uh, never set the law above his love. Okay, because love is what is going to be produced when you are in his presence. But if you come out of his presence and you don't express that love, then you're canceling it. You're not a living sacrifice. Because to express the love of God is going to require that you're a living sacrifice. Because your humanity doesn't want, let, let's go, doesn't want to have joy that overflows because you want to look at your situation and be mad. Your, your, your humanity says, inner peace, man, I know the chaos is here. What are you talking about inner peace? Your, your humanity says patience. No, they need to just get it right. Sounds like me. Uh, uh, kindness in action. <laughs> but you think I'm preaching to myself too. I ain't perfect. If you think I'm perfect, boy, am I going to offend you? <laughs> we are all being perfected. I just happen to be one be the one chosen for this pulpit. Because you got to honor whom God chooses. You got to honor whom God makes your leader. You notice how I said makes your leader. I didn't say you choose your leader. I say whom God makes your leader. Amen? All right, I think you got point number one. Praise God. So let's go to Jeremiah 31, 33. It says, the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's scripture, right? Okay, let's go to Hebrews 8.10. So we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Hebrews 8.10 says, now, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel in the days to come, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Wait a minute. I thought we didn't have the law. But Jesus, uh, Jesus teaches us a new way. He says, don't set the law above love. So the law isn't eradicated. <laughs> it's updated. It isn't eradicated. It's updated according to his truths. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't get religious on me today. Okay. It's not eradicated, it's updated. And so now we follow according to what Jesus tells us to follow. That's, that's why even Paul, how many of you know that you can find in the scripture where Paul goes and, and he actually, he actually go, leaves a place to go and recognize the times of the feast. Now why would Paul do that? If the laws have been eradicated, why, why would Paul recognize the feast if the time had been eradicated? I mean, if the laws have been eradicated, because Paul knew that he would not let the feast be higher than love, but he would still look at what Jesus left behind. He would still look at what recognizes Jesus as our Savior. He would still look because all the feasts point to Jesus. So how can you get rid of something that points to Jesus? That would be like saying, get rid of the burning bush. Anybody believe that there was a burning bush that Moses ran into? 
See, see, we got to be careful because we want to believe what we want to believe and not believe what we don't want to believe. Because what we want to do is we want to believe according to our level of comfort, according to our level of willingness to be a sacrifice. And so we've got to be careful. Amen? And then let's just go to Matthew 5, 17, because I want to I make sure you understand I'm preaching to you the word of God. Amen? I know I use a lot of scriptures. My team, you know, they got to copy and paste a lot of scriptures into the presentation. Uh, but it's because I need you to understand and know that this is the word. This isn't Brian Valley. It isn't Apostle Brian or Pastor Brian or whatever you call me. It's the word. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses. Who said that? Um, who said that? <laughs> Jesus said that. But I know if you've been in church long enough, you've been to a church that told you there's no such thing as the law anymore. But Jesus said, do not think, and, I, and I'll teach this more because I know I'm going to have to teach it more now. Okay, because, you know, I don't want you to go home and make an altar and start burning stuff, okay? <laughs> That's witchcraft. <laughs> Jesus came and did away with that. Let's just get at least that clear. Okay, don't come over here with a cow next week and, and tell me I need to eat the fat of the lamb because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the pastor. <laughs> now, if you want to invite me for a barbecue, that's a different thing. Okay? I got to be clear. All right, do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. He came with grace so that we can live above the law. Amen? Do not set love below the law. Because that's what we do. We say, yeah, but I don't have to love them because the Bible says this. Eh, wrong answer. You're putting the law above love. And Galatians says, do not do that. Amen? All right, let's go. Let's, let's move on because Jesus is coming soon. And we've got to make sure we get to where we got to go. So you cannot pick and choose what and when you will obey. Understand? Number two, never set comfort above obedience. So never set love above the law. Number two, never set comfort above obedience. Amen? Let's go to Deuteronomy 12, 11 through 14. And it says, the Lord will choose a single place where he is to be worshipped. And so, so, you know, all these people who think they can go to five different churches, the Lord is going to choose your place of worship. And he ain't going to choose five of them because then you're going to be, you're going to have five heads. And the last time I checked, that's a monster. You only need to have one head. Okay, the Lord will choose a single place where he is to be worshipped. And there you must bring to him everything that I have commanded. Uh-oh. So you got to have one place of worship. And you're supposed to bring to that place what he has commanded you. What gifts are you holding back? What service are you holding back? What tithe are you holding back? What offering are you holding back? Because those are all the commands that you're supposed to bring to the storehouse. The one place of worship that he has called you to. Your sacrifices that are to be burnt and your other sacrifices, your tithes and your offerings and those special gifts that you have promised to the Lord. Be joyful there in his presence. Uh-oh, don't come to church, old man. Come joyful. Because if you don't, then you're canceling what? Love. Or if you just remember that, your whole life will change. Together with your children, your servants, and the Levites who live in your town, remember that the Levites will have no land of their own. You are not to offer your sacrifices wherever you choose. Boy, he just got a little bit more clearer there. You must offer them only in the one place that the Lord will choose in the territory of one of your tribes. Only there are you to offer your sacrifices that are to be burnt and do all the other things that I have commanded you. Again, he's reminding you. Can we keep on? His command is his law. 
He has written them on your hearts through revelation. You are accountable for the revelation you have received and you must obey it to its fullness. Is everybody hearing me? Jesus didn't come for you to be comfortable, for you to pick and choose the sacrifice that you want to give. That's what the men of old did. And they created traditions and they added to the law to justify their lack of love. Why do you think Jesus saved the prostitute, the woman who was sleeping around? Why do you think Jesus saved her? Because he was setting love above the law. Hmm. God has chosen you as his living sacrifice. Replacing the sacrifice of animals with Jesus' life and now yours. You are the living sacrifice. He has called you to be a living sacrifice. Amen? Let's go to Hebrews 10, 11 through 18. I want you to understand this today. Every Jewish priest performs his service every day and offers the same sacrifices many times, but these sacrifices can never take away sin. So that's why we don't, that's why we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Cause, cause he's telling us, yeah, I know they did it in the Old Testament, but, but we got to get upgraded. Anybody want to be upgraded in this place? All right, let's go. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sins, an offering that is effective forever, and then he sat down at the right hand side of the of God. There he now, oh, he waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. Don't be going looking for vengeance because God wants you to put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. Don't look for vengeance. Don't look to go get people back. Don't look, you, you know. <laughs> Has anybody ever told you, I just got to tell you this. Don't do that. Let God speak on your behalf. Okay, there he, okay, with one sacrifice, then he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. And the Holy Spirit also gives us his witness. First, he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them in the days to come, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he says, I will not remember their sins and evil deeds any longer. So when these have been forgiven and offering to take away sin is no Longer needed. No longer needed. So this is why we do not sacrifice animals. But he does call us to be a living sacrifice. Does everybody understand that today? So the question is, will you surrender? Will you serve? Will you give when he calls upon you? When, when, when we call upon you as your leaders, will you serve? Will you teach? Will you help us when we call upon you? Or do you pick and choose what you're going to help with, when you're going to give, how you're going to give, when you're going to come to church? Are you picking and choosing? Because you know that even coming to church reveals that you're a living sacrifice. Coming into the house of God and lifting up your hands and praising him, a living sacrifice. You know, the Jews never complained or murmured about the sacrifices they had to give to God. They actually would walk miles to go to the one place that God told them to give their sacrifice. They would travel for days and not one complaint or murmur would come out of their mouth as they carried their sacrifice to the one place that God told them to carry their sacrifice. And today we have become so comfortable We must be careful with comfort because it comes to wrap itself around us and take us away from the things of God. It comes to rob us of the grace that enables us to be a living sacrifice. And it's the living sacrifice that God is pleased with. It's the living sacrifice that praises him, the living sacrifice that worships him, the living sacrifice that carries and produces his glory, the living sacrifice. Amen? Your sacrifice reveals who or what your foundation has been set on. 
Your sacrifice reveals what kingdom you belong to. You see, if Sunday morning comes and the alarm goes off and you wake up and you're happy and you take a shower and maybe you got to fight through tiredness, but you're fighting. Well, you belong to the kingdom of God. But if you turn around and you hit snooze and you say, I'll just go to church next Sunday. Who did you just sacrifice to? Because it surely wasn't the kingdom of God. Look at what you sacrifice and you'll know what kingdom you're founded on. That's, it really, like, and you need to look at it because guess what? Jesus came so that you could be forgiven. The Bible says he came and shed his blood so that you can be cleansed and forgiven, which means all you got to do is recognize that you're in a bad place, repent and be transformed. Repentance reveals you know the truth about yourself and you need to come to terms with Jesus. Transformation means you're living out that truth. Amen? Amen? Amen. How many of you have repented and then went back to the sin? Don't, don't worry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Some of you went to raise your hand and then I said the next one, you whoa. <laughs> what you're doing is you're saying, I know the truth, but I don't want to live it. What you're doing is you're saying, I know the truth, but I don't want to be a living sacrifice. That, that, what you, so because repentance says you know the truth, but only transformation says you're living that truth. A lot of us, we live on this place of, in this place of repentance. We're always at the feet of Jesus. No, you got to pick up that cross and you better start walking with that truth. Amen. Amen? Amen. Number three today, never set your own place. Stay in his. Never set your own place. Stay in his. Because it's in this place that your visitation, power from on high, will come for you to be a witness to the ends of the earth. Only moved by his command. Amen? Acts 1, 6 through 8. Acts 1, 6 through 8. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, how many of you know Jesus told them, go and wait? They could only wait if they had love because waiting is an expression of love. So the apostles went where Jesus told them and waited because they loved him. Will you go where Jesus is telling you and wait because you love him? Because when you do that, you become a living sacrifice. And that is the worship that he's looking for. God is looking for your worship. He's looking for your worship. See, they went to the upper room where Jesus told them to go and they waited. They obeyed. Living sacrifices receive power from on high. Listen, if you're, if you're dealing with something in your life and you've been dealing with it for quite some time now and for some reason you can't get through this situation, it's because you have no power. And if you have no power, it's because there's no sacrifice. Amen? And you guys are going to get my notes if, if you're signed up. If we have your email, you will get my notes. And I will challenge you to walk this out tomorrow. You'll get it around 5 o'clock. Amen? Let's go to Acts 2, 1 through 4. Acts 2, 1 through 4 says, When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. <laughs> Suddenly, there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Now, the interesting thing about this is that they were together, and, corp and, and the Holy Spirit came, so corporately, 
they received from the Holy Spirit. And then individually in twos, they all went out. So we come together to receive, to then go out. A lot of people want to prophesy in the church. A lot of people want to release power in the church. They didn't stay in the upper room and start prophesying to each other. <laughs> they didn't stay in the upper room and start laying hands on each other. They didn't, they didn't go down the stairs to the street with the people in the upper room while nobody was looking and prophesied to them. They went to strangers in the street and started being witnesses of the mighty God. They started being witnesses to those that they encountered. A witness means you're witnessing to somebody who doesn't know. But we love to witness to fellow Christians. You don't have power to witness to fellow Christians. You have power to witness to the strangers, the ones who don't know Jesus, the ones who need to be saved, the ones who need to be healed and delivered. Did they stay in the upper room, Thomas? They didn't stay there. They didn't, they didn't stay. Jose, they didn't stay. Se fueron. Oh, there's the English service. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, no matter what people say, don't leave the place he has set you in because you're looking for comfort. Because your comfort ain't going to get you no power. It's the place that he set you in that's going to get you the power. It's the place that he's, see, he set you in a place to process you so that you can become a channel to receive his power. You, you, you know, I know now we plug in cable to our TV. But anybody ever have a TV with rabbit antennas? <laughs> I just told my age. You know, my grandmother lived on the 13th floor all my life. And it's interesting to me that even though the TV was always in the same place with the same rabbit ears, we always had to go and move the rabbit ears around to get a good signal. I never could understand that. But if the TV was good yesterday, then why do I need to move it around and shift it here and there to get a good signal today? Because it was always about the positioning. And when you're comfortable, you stop moving. When you're comfortable, you come out of place because God's already moved to another signal. And you're trying to figure out why can't I see clear? Why ain't I getting instruction? Why ain't he answering me? Have you tried moving? Have you tried adjusting yourself? You have to be. So what does that mean? Right? What does that mean? If he sets you in redemption and you're going through your process, he's processing you to receive the glory. So he's going to teach you how to praise. He's going to teach you how to worship because he needs to prepare you for the glory. How many of you want the glory? And I don't want, I don't want you to just carry the glory. I want you to produce the glory. Okay? There are so many of you called to do so many great things. But you allowing that calling to be the very obstacle that stops you from getting to that call. Because you're not letting God process you for the call. And if he can't process you for the call, he can't release it. He can't release it. Let God be God in your life. Let God be God in your life. Be a living sacrifice. It's what he's called you to be. How many of you know he's promised this house that he's going to enlarge our tents? He's promised this house that he's going to enlarge our territory. He's promised this house that families are going to be restored. Children are going to return home, right? Didn't he promise that? He promised this house the sevenfold blessing. He promised this house the spoils of war. What was stolen from you will be returned, and it will be returned sevenfold. He has promised that to this house. How are we going to get there? By obeying our king. <laughs> By being a living sacrifice. That's how we're going to get there. Not by, not by being home comfortable. 
Not by saying no when, they ask, when you're asked to do something in church. Oh, well, no, I can't do that because I got to do this, this, and that. And everything is you, 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 you. That's not a living sacrifice. That's a person living in the confines of their own comfort. That's not kingdom. It's not kingdom. And God has something for all of us. God has something greater for all of us. He wants to do something in us and through us that as individuals will manifest his glory everywhere we go as families. I, I was, somebody called me the other day. I just remembered this. Somebody called me the other day and they said, listen, man, I don't know if you know this, but your family is a supernatural family. I have never met, I've met a lot of men and women of God. But when I met you and your wife, you guys are just supernatural. You, you guys, are the, you're the glory. And I'm like, what does this guy want? <laughs> and he goes, listen, I don't want anything. Because I mean, you know, God reads our thoughts. And then he, unbeknownst to him, he says, I don't want anything. But if you can, will you mentor me? Because I want a supernatural family. I want to be a man of God that builds a family the way you've built your family. And this is somebody who lives in Illinois. They don't even live here. You guys, say again. Oh, I heard you now. I'm not going to repeat that one. <laughs> you guys have what people are calling my wife and I for. You guys have it right here. Yesterday, I got a text. Something very similar to what this other man, this, this one was a little, I guess it was different, but they asked me to do something that's of a high esteem. Because when they look at my wife and I, they see the glory. What I'm preaching to you today Trust me when I tell you God gave me that scripture and he told me to tell the church they need to come out of their place of comfort. And I'm going to read you the scripture again because I think we should read it. Deuteronomy 12, 11 through 14. And it says, The Lord will choose a single place where he is to be worshipped and there you must bring to him everything that I have commanded. Your sacrifices that are to be burnt and your other sacrifices, your tithes and your offerings and those special gifts that you have promised to the Lord. Listen, if this is your house, if God has told you to come to this house, maybe you're visiting today because you're looking for a house. You're here because God called you here. You ain't, you ain't hearing this message for nothing. Don't, don't, don't be fooled and discern right. If this is your house, I believe God is challenging each and every single one of us to take the next level of commitment, to take that next step and not just come to the house of God, but to serve in the house of God. And for some of you, not just to serve in the house of God, but to help build in the house of God. And for some of you, it can be something like it's time for you to start tithing and giving your offering. You know, the, the lack you see won't change until you tithe and offer. It just, I'm, I'm sorry, but the, the, the principle of the seed is you're going to reap what you sow. And if you want what's in heaven for you, you got to understand when you give your tithe and offering, you ain't, I'm just the mediator. I'm receiving it for God. And then once you give it to me for God, guess what happens? I'm held responsible to what I do with it. It is released from your hands and now God can release upon you what is yours because of what you have sown. And then I become responsible as a steward of receiving for God. 
And that's where you pray for your pastor. And that's where you, you pray for the house of God and you pray for the church to make sure we're always doing the right things. But I, let, let me tell you something, I'm pretty, I'm pretty astute when it comes to accounting, when it comes to those kind of things. And, and, and my wife and I, we've been able to, to do right by your tithe and offering. We don't, we don't give ourselves an absorbent salary. That's why we help, we do a lot of things around the world. You know, and right now we're looking for a bigger place because soon we're gonna have to knock down walls and, 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 and hold people in the lobby and the whole nine yards. But while we wait, allow God to process you and just be the living sacrifice so that he can prepare you for your next because I know that your next is greater. I know that he wants to restore your family. I know he wants to restore your finances. I know, I know that some of you, that there's businesses that he wants to restore, businesses that he wants to open, businesses that he wants to take to the next level. There's so many things going on right now in the spirit. So many things. And one of the things that I've been learning is that praise causes things to happen in the spirit. Do you know when they walked around Jericho with praises on their lips, in the spirit realm, the foundation of Jericho was being weakened. In the spirit realm, the walls of Jericho were being weakened so that on the seventh day, the walls had to fall down. I, I, I want you to understand today that even when you give your praise as a living sacrifice, God is doing something in the midst of your praise. Even when you're giving praise and you come into the house of the Lord, listen, I, I don't, don't come to the house of the Lord without being ready to praise. I know things are going on out there. I know sometimes you come in here and, and it's like the world is attacking you. Chaos is all over you. Circumstances don't want to go away. Situations want to whisper in your ear. I challenge you today. Cancel it all and praise the Lord. Cancel it. Say whispers go away because I'm going to praise the Lord. Because when you praise the Lord, what you're saying is, I know my God, and I know he's going to do it. What you're saying is, I serve a God who can do anything. What you're saying is, I'm going to release my praise, and he's going to release his promises. But we got to be a living sacrifice. So we're going to praise today. You know, Psalm 47, 1 says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. God likes when we shout. Psalm 98, 5 says, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Shout in jubilation and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord. Psalm 118, 15 says, the sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. It says the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. When you praise, you exalt the hand of the Lord to do something for you. Psalm 100 verse four says, enter his gates with songs of thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You see, when you begin to praise him, you get escorted into his courts and he begins to hear and receive your praise and it becomes the seed that releases his promise. Praise is the beginning of entering in and redemption we need to enter. I'm gonna read this one scripture and then we're gonna praise. Amen? Hosea 2, 20 through 23. I want you to understand this. Because no matter what part of your process you're in, if you just understand you need to praise the Lord, he'll release what he's gonna release from heaven. If you'll just understand in the midst of your circumstances, no matter what it look like, praise the Lord. 
You have no idea what you're doing in the spirit realm. But today you're going to have an idea. It says in Hosea 2, 20 to 23. I will keep my promise and make you mine. This is God speaking to you. And you will acknowledge me as Lord. At that time, I will answer the prayers of my people, Israel. Of my people, redemption. I will make rain fall on the earth. And the earth will produce corn and grapes and olives. I will establish my people in the land and make them prosper. I will show love to those who were called unloved. And to those who were called not my people. I will say you are my people. And they will answer you are our God. I want you to know today that when you praise, you are releasing a sound into the heavens. G give me my iPad, give me my iPad. I need to go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Cynthia, put Revelation 19. Five to um, seven. I want you to understand today. Oh, I, I need you to understand as we as we close this service out in praise. I want you to understand that you are releasing what God wants to hear in heaven. You are releasing seed. You see, we always want to hear God's voice, but how about if God wants to hear your voice? How about if God wants to hear your praise? How about if He wants to hear you shout? says then from the throne there came a voice saying praise our God all you bond servants of his you who fear him do I have any people who fear the Lord in this place the small common and the great distinguished then I heard something like the shout of a vast multitude and like the boom of many pounding waves and like the roar of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the ruler of all reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy. Let us give him glory and honor for the marriage of the Lamb has come at last and his bride the redeemed has prepared herself you know what's an indication that the bride is being prepared her praise <laughs> praise releases provision for the bride Praise causes things to get out of the way of the bride. Praise causes, uh, praises go up and God's promises come down. God wants your seat of praise this afternoon. Will you praise him? Will you be a living sacrifice and worship the Lord with your praise this afternoon? Come on, if that's you, I want you to come to the front.
is hurt. Whatever obstacle has been in your way from going to the next level, to the next dimension, the next sphere in God, your praise is what's going to cause that obstacle to dissipate. Your praise is what's going to remove the obstacle from being in your way. But you've got to praise like you've never praised before. You've got to praise like you know the promises of God are being released over your life. So if you praise and you believe that, I want you to shout. Oh, come on, I want you to shout. Our sovereign Lord, He reigns. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Master reigns, our God is strong. He reigns in power and majesty. Our sovereign Lord, He reigns. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Master reigns, our God is strong. He reigns in power and majesty. Our right there where you're at and repeat after me say father today I praise you because I know that as my praise goes up your promises will come down you are receiving my praise a worship unto you and father today I receive the truth of your word where I have not given you my sacrifice when you have asked for it I repent today I ask for your forgiveness but more importantly I repent I will turn around from that truth I bind the spirit of comfort and convenience and I commit to you this day that when you ask for something, I will say yes. When you require something of me, I will say yes. When you release a revelation over my life, I will become that revelation. I will be a doer of your word. I will live for you and you alone. And as I live for you, I know and believe that you will live for me. And I will live on earth 
as it is in heaven. I thank you this day for removing obstacles. I thank you this day for pouring out your spirit wherever situations might be and making that place right so that when I walk in it, the situation is gone and you will be glorified. Father, here I am. I love you because you first loved me. Let my love be revealed through my actions. I receive the grace to live above the law. I receive the grace to do what you've called me to do. I receive the grace to walk through my process and be perfected for everything you have for me. Let it be in my life. Let it be in my family's life. Let it be in the house you have called me to and in the community I live in as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. For I am the living, active, powerful Word of God. Amen and amen and amen.